okay? All right, strep throat. You've been under a rock if you don't know what that is. However, the lay person's term is strep throat. The clinical term is streptococcal pharyngitis. And with this, one of the biggest issues you can remember with this is that it has two very serious complications that can result because of the causing bacteria. Now, I want you to kind of put a little note to self. There are several infections that are caused by group A. They include impetigo, which was contact precautions, impetigo, streptococcal pharyngitis, strep throat, and of course, scarlet fever. Now, these group A infections are important for you to remember because when an infection has been caused by group A, A strep, because group A streptococcus, when an infection has been caused by group A, the complication can be either rheumatic fever, rheumatic fever, or glomerular nephritis. Glomerular nephritis. Okay, so that's crazy. So if you think about glomerular nephritis, that's tea-colored urine, you remember. If you think about rheumatic fever, that's a high fever with migrating joint pain, all that good stuff, and it can give you endocarditis. The valve affected is the mitral valve. It's really bad. Okay, a lot of people have that. You see that if you're watching television, every other commercial has been about AFib, have you noticed? Well, you have to think your historical um, analysis of why that is. Why has everybody and their mother-in-law got AFib? Well, because you have to remember that penicillin didn't come out until the 1920s, 30s, you know, that time frame, 30s, uh, 1933 or something like that. Uh, but anyway, penicillin didn't come out till then. Well, there's people alive now that had strep throat and everything else before penicillin came out. And they have had rheumatic fever as an adult and a child. And the complication of rheumatic fever, fever is AFib or a flutter. So you, you have to know your history to know where you're going. That's not just a saying that we say. You have to know your history to know where you're going. Why is it that everybody has AFib? And then you also have to understand that you get a significant amount of AFib in the elderly person 80 years old and up, especially a lot of African Americans, because even though penicillin came out, when you think of segregation, which happened all during the 60s, 50s, 40s, and 30s, it wasn't like our hospitals had the same access to penicillin, okay? I remember specifically hospitals in this very city where that's where the blacks go. Okay, you just don't get the same care. Separate is never equal in this case, okay? So, you know, you're gonna see a lot of AFib and flutter. Now, you have scarlet fever as something I mentioned. And you have to be careful with this because it's not always like it would be for glomerular nephritis or rheumatic fever. It's not always an issue. In fact, it's rarely an issue that the strep didn't get treated. Because we know when you don't treat strep, or you don't treat it right and long enough and correctly, you can get these complications of rheumatic fever or you can get glomerular nephritis, all that crap, right? You know that. This is not true. That's not gonna be actually true for this. Sometimes what happens with scarlet fever is it precedes the strep throat. So it came first. So it wasn't like you didn't treat the strep throat, it just happened before. And I know this because my child had it. So with scarlet fever, which is not that uncommon, by the way, you had to remember it was a sandpaper type of rash, like a prickly needlepoint sandpaper rash. You had to remember it itches really bad to the point of your child screaming. It's everywhere. It's in the mouth. It's on the face. It's in the ears. It's all over everywhere, the feet the legs, the trunk, it's horrible. 
this kid is itching all over. Now, I'll tell you how good nurses are. When my daughter had it, I took her, I was actually at Ursuline. No, I might have been just graduating. I don't remember. But all I remember is being stupid enough to look in my pediatric books and try to figure it out. And I looked through all these rashes and all this crap, and what is this crap she has? I couldn't figure it out. However, within five seconds, the Rainbow Babies and Children's Nurse figured it out. How do I know she figured it out? Well, she looked at my little five-year-old or four-year-old, and she said, huh, oh boy, looks like you need a throat culture. I'm thinking, what's wrong with this woman? This is a rash. Well, she knew, unlike me, that this rash appearance, which is all she had did was look at it, what had the, the appearance of scarlet fever, and the only way to diagnose scarlet fever is a throat culture. It's a skin rash. But it's the only skin rash under respiratory, just like RSV is the only respiratory condition under contact. Because this skin rash or scarlet fever is caused by scarlet is caused by strep A. So she looked at her and she said, "You need a throat culture." And sure enough, she did the throat culture, and there's my kid with strep throat. Her throat didn't hurt. She asked her, "Your throat? No." Mm -mm. The next day it did. So I can precede the actual strep throat. Anybody else had a strep, uh, scarlet fever? It's not that uncommon. Who had it? Me. Oh! Like six. six years old? What did it feel like? I don't remember thinking, but I just remember how it looked all over. Like it's everywhere. It is everywhere. It's in your mouth. mouth. Yeah, it's a little weird. And did you get the little throat culture? Did they recognize what it was immediately? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, these rashes you get good at when you're a pediatric nurse because you've got to know so many. You know, measles, mumps, rubella, you've got this chicken pox, you've got this impetigo, you've got this rash with scarlet fever, you've got all this crap. You've got to know it well. I remember having a fever when it seemed like a high-grade fever. Uh, she didn't have a high-grade fever either, but she had a little fever. But you're right, it doesn't have to be a fever yet because it precedes the obvious, okay? All right, now, so that was scarlet fever. Uh-oh. Parvo B19. Mm, mm, mm. One of your challenges as a nurse is that you have to know more than one name for everything. <laughs> In this case, you have a lot of names. What's the other names? Slap, Slap cheek or fifth disease. Now, before you go on this test, I'm a fist. This is what I'm saying. Look up here. Five. The other name for five is fifth. So watch this. This is how you're going to remember it. It takes all five fingers to slap the cheek out of this patient. Okay? So Fitz disease, slap cheek. That's how you're going to remember it. Fitz disease, slap cheek. Parvo B19, all three are the names. This is a childhood condition. It is very pronounced in that the child has very rosy red cheeks. And they have, quote me here, a lace-like, like lace on clothing, a lace-like pattern to a rash all over their body. But as with most conditions, it starts with the face. So they have a rosy red rash on the face, and they have a lace-like pattern rash all over their arms, their trunk, so it looks like a lace, like it's lacy, white mixed with red kind of thing, purplish. Okay, so it's lace-like rash all over the body. And the face is very rosy red. As with most childhood conditions, the child has a fever. By the way, this condition is self-limiting which means there's no medicinal treatment. It's going to kind of resolve. Unfortunately, what's so horrible about Parvo B19, what's so bad about it? It's a teratogen. So when I was an OBGYN nurse midwife, I got plenty of calls for this one. Because what are typically first grade, kindergarten, second grade, and third grade teachers? Females. And they would be very pregnant. And here we got a new diagnosis of two or three kids in their class with Parvo B19. 
And so the principal would tell them to call their OB. And I would get this call. This is a very seasonal thing. It's like spring, fall. I would get this call from this teacher, frantic, as is appropriate. And she would be concerned about her child, her unborn child, and she should be. Because under 20 weeks, this is a significant issue. Under 20 weeks, this is a significant issue. So she has to come in and I have to do a workup. Depending on what the workup is, I may have to do some antenatal surveillance. You guys know what that is. That's called a BPP, NST, blah, blah, blah. That's your maternity. Hooked you up. OK, flu. For my students, I teach that the flu has seven symptoms that must be there, or it's not the flu. Because one of your challenges is going to be to try to anticipate what the patient may have so that you're prepared for the doctor when he comes, or the nurse practitioner. So when you look at the patient with the flu and you're doing a quick history, there are some key components to the flu that don't go with anything else. The number one key component to the flu is that you have body aches and pains, and they're so bad, you feel like a Mack truck rolled over you, and then somebody stomped you. Very much pain. Body aches and pains. I tell you to remember seven, and body aches and pains stand for two. Remember seven, body aches and pains stand for two. And then we add two more, fever and chills because chills always goes with fever. Fever and chills. Then we're going to add two more. Anorexia and fatigue. Because if you don't eat, of course you're going to be tired. So anorexia and fatigue. The seventh symptom is headache. Now you typically got to have all those for you to be talking about somebody look like they got the flu. Now, you can add to it, but you can't subtract from it. You can add coughing. You can add sore throat. You can add whatever you want, but you got to have those seven. OK? And you know there's a flu vaccine. What did you see in the news lately? Who can't take the nasal spray? It was in the news. Well, that was always. I'm talking about it's new in the news because it's ineffective. They don't want to give the children the nasal spray anymore. Because this year, they are advocating no more nasal sprays in children and babies. Because it's not been effective, hasn't worked at all. Now, of course, the nasal spray is not appropriate ever for pregnant women or the immunosuppressed patient. But the flu vaccine injection is highly advised for the pregnant woman OK, and the immunosuppressed patient. You have a set of chronically ill patients that must get a flu vaccine every year. Those patients include people like diabetics, asthmatics, asthmatics, uh, kidney failure, sickle cell anemia, COPD, CHF, previous MI. I could go on and on and on, but the point I'm making is chronic illness gets a flu vaccine every year. And the complication of the flu is what again? Pneumonia. pneumonia. What's the complication of pneumonia? Ards. You got it. Sound like you know a little bit. OK, adenovirus. And then we get to go on a little break or whatever. Adenovirus, before our break, is basically the same infectious material that cause a common cold. And typically, it's respiratory, so we put it under droplet. But it could be from the GI system, at which point it would go back over in contact. But for now, because 99% of these patients have a respiratory condition, we're going to put it under droplet, adenovirus. Same exact causative factor for a common cold. Why would I put it on the board if that's all it is? Well. In the immunosuppressed patient, it will kill them. So nothing is common when you're immunosuppressed. In the immunosuppressed patient, it could kill them, adenovirus. Okay. 
Now, you're going to take about 15, 20 minutes. When you come back, we're going to do some hard stuff, like airborne and the rest of these um, droplet precautions.